Hello everyone, Neri here from Drake Wing Gaming. So if you don't know me on Twitter, the Gaming Dragon. Today I'm coming at you to the Let's Play episode of Echo Jenna's Path. So, the last place we left off. Let's see. Ah oh, yes, the horrifying thing that creeped its way into the room and stood right behind Leo, and then everyone freaked out. That was awesome. All right. I think we should probably get back into it. All right, alarm chain, you are up. All right, guys, sit back and let me entertain you for the next 20 minutes. All right. <clears throat> it's all so familiar. We should probably get out of here. Agreed. I'm going to grab my stuff and pack your trunk. You think we should leave? Yes. I need to get back to Pueblo and take a few mental health days. We'll finish packing, pick up TJ, and drop Leo off at the clinic. His dad can take him home later. Leo picks at his freshly wrapped bandages. Why did it touch him? I need to find Carl. Jenna says nothing to Leo's insistence, the phoenix shoving her dirty clothes into a garbage bag. Leo, I don't really know what more we can do. I'll handle it, and then you can come back. His red eyes meet mine for the first time in a while. I'm struck by the level of compassion in them. For a second, it reminds me of the best moments of our relationship. My heart's still thudding in my ears and my legs weak. I managed to force a smile toward the dazed wolf. Right, of course. Doctor first, though. I'm about ready to check myself in, too. <laughs> he cants his head, peering at me curiously. I'll find Carl. Don't worry. There's a knocking on the window. Awkward taps followed by a crooning falsetto voice. Carl! I found Carl! It makes Jen and I jump, both of us freezing in place. Who's there? Leo asks sleepily. Oh, it's Mika. Misha. Misha. Blah. Misha. Okay. It's me! Misha! More knocking. This time a little harder. Misha. Leo blinks, suddenly seeming more awake. He clutches the end of the bed, pushing himself up to his feet. The wolf is a little wobbly. He's still swaying behind him as he tries to keep his balance. Yeah, it's me! Open the door! There's something off about his voice. I don't think it's him. Leo steps over toward the window and draws the curtains before I can tell him to stop. The familiar outline of the bat's massive ears pokes up over the bottom of the sill. He's crouched down like he's afraid to be seen. Jenna steps up beside me, watching on from a distance. Misha lifts his head a little, and I notice that he has this strange expression on his face, like he's not fully awake. There's also something attached to the scruff of his neck. The bat's face is, the bat's face is snout squarely against the window, blood squirting from his nose and coating both the pain in his face. Fuck! Oh god, Leo, get back! Misha slumps aside, falling out of sight as the figure who was making the voice reveals himself. Brian. The bear rams open the door, bits of splintered wood from the frame showering the carpet. Leo, get back! Leo turns to face him just as something metal strikes across his face. I don't hear the impact, but Leo crumples just the same. He points the thing at me now, and I realize quickly it's a gun. He smiles at me for a second, approaching me next. I try to back up, but there's nowhere to run. He grabs me by the shirt, and I feel my body swing around. Don't you fucking... Fuck. Jesus. Oh, God, now Jenna's involved in... Oh! Well, this is new. The coyote latches onto my shoulder, yanking me back. Something hard smacks into my skull, and I feel my mind rattle. I lurch away, essentially butt-bumping the coyote as my ears ring from the prior blow. JJ's still on the ground, crying and covered in booze as the bullies stand around him. My movement goes sluggish, and it's like I've become a zombie, shambling toward the door as my vision blurs. Is this what being knocked out feels like? I clench my fists and keep up my own pace, trying to blink away the blurriness. Ooh, so surreal. Eventually, I reach the entrance. Carl! Leo! As I reach the outside, my knees lock and I drop to the concrete. The impact rattles my bones as I catch myself with my wrists, just barely managing to avoid falling directly on my muzzle. I take a deep breath. I'm still conscious. At least, half conscious. I continue crawling, trying to ignore the throbbing pain. Carl! Shouting now, my voice sounds foreign to me. Shrill, childlike, pathetic, and increasingly hoarse. L Leo! My voice shouldn't be this croaky. I've barely talked today. I'm in the middle of the road now. Where's Carl? I should get out of here before a car comes. I pull myself along the asphalt, feeling my skin scrape beneath my fur. 
I want to stand, but I'll probably just fall again. And so I keep crawling, rolling into what seems like some sort of detention basin. I stare up at the sky, fighting the sudden fatigue and gritting my teeth through the pain. At first I think it's blood that I got in my eyes, but upon rubbing them, I realize that isn't the case. The sky is different, like someone slapped one of those colored gel, mo uh, colored gel matte filters over it. What the hell? I rub my eyes again, attempting to focus. I can't stay here. TJ, TJ's in deep shit. Those idiots, those, those assholes. Sucking a sharp breath through my teeth, I rise to a stand, praying my knees don't walk up again. Find Carl. Find Leo. I stumble out of the detention basin, feeling packed, so fact packed soil beneath my feet. What the fuck is that? A dirt road. Looking behind me, I realize I must have crawled farther than I thought. Parsons looks over a mile away? That can't be right. I see a van ahead. That's a van, okay. It looks rusted and old, but there's a light on the inside. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, I know what this is. I step stiff-leggedly down the road a ways, reaching the bend where the vehicle sits. The same redness of the sky that the sky is tinted with pulsates from the interior. I try to speak, but no words come from my throat. It's like a dream. I want to do the rational thing and announce myself, but I can't. I move closer, peering into the dusty back window. Inside the window is another window, and in that window, a little red dot in the corner, flashing on and off. In the window within a window, there is a writhing, flashes of fur contorted and undulating in constant, restless motion. Something is trying to hold it in place. I hear a clap and a cry. The clapping continues. Louder now. Rhythmic, yet singular applause. Oh, God. This is what you want, says the voice that cried. I stare, slowly finding the will to speak. No, I need to help my friends. Do you know where they are? The voice shifts some, more urgent. We heard gunfire coming from the town. It's real bad. Gunfire? I didn't hear anything. Please, help me find my friends. We can't find them all now. We need to go. They're lost. No, they're not. I'll keep looking. I'll keep looking myself. You're just going in circles. I feel tears well within my eyes. I lump in my throat, containing a choked sob. Please. The van's back door is open. I'm standing too close, and it pushes me onto my back. The red light is gone now, replaced by darkness, shifting shadows within. I see them now. Tarantulas. Their eight legs fuzz with white and rust-colored stripes. They're on me with haste, two of them, one on each of my arms. They bite so hard, so quickly, I can't yell. They pull and tug at me, another pair at my legs. Jesus. I pulled up and into the van, my body stretched upon a squishy something that begins to sink, into, to sink against my arms and legs. There's no more light, and I stare paralyzed at what I think is the ceiling of the van in the pitch blackness. It feels like restraints are binding me in place. I try to adjust my eyes to the darkness, but everything seems blurry and unclear. My head throbs like a heartbeat, the pangs of pain unrelenting. My fur bristles. Where did the spiders go? Breathing has become more difficult, as if the oxygen in the van was running out. I feel the veins in my neck bulge as I try to, gra try to gasp for large breaths. My body is not my own. Light seems to pop as the ringing in my ears intensifies. Something is above me. I can sense it. There's a, gar there's a garbled muttering coming forth from, from it, as if spoken through a poorly tuned AM radio. It sounds... like me. You knocked him out? I swear, I barely touched him, man. Fucking... pants on. Dude! Just go! Leo! I... Go! Before he wakes up! I'll see you... party? It goes quiet. Then after a few more seconds... Chase! 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 The voice changes. This time the voice is throbbing within my head. Have you ever killed anyone? Dog! No! Oh, fuck. Fuck, that's creepy. What the hell? Oof. Chase. I hear my name once again, and I lean forward, only to find my head pounding and something metal around my neck. Chase. Oh, here we go again. I was hoping we could avoid this part again, but I suppose... Ah, it's going to play out differently this time, though. Again, my name is spoken. The voice is a cor the voice, of course, raps that sounds somewhat familiar. 
I blinked several times, trying to get the blurriness to leave my eyes. It felt puffy, like I'd been crying a lot. Sure enough, as I touched my cheeks, I could feel wet stains. I must have wept while I was out. Finally, my vision clears enough that I can get a read on my surroundings. It's some kind of trailer, with trash and stained clothing scattered about everywhere. Most of it's beer bottles and old TV dinner packages, with a few stacks of vintage science magazines and newspapers along the back wall. Dishes and junk are piled high along the length of the counter, and it smells like cigarette smoke. Brian must have brought me here. Maybe this is his place. As the reality of the situation sinks in, I quickly try to stand up, but the sudden tugging on my throat pulls me back down. I clutch at it, and realize it's some kind of metal collar which is keeping me pinned to the wood paneled wall. Chase! This time I turn and crane my head, or my head back to identify the source. Carl! My heart leaps, but stops cold once I notice the position he's in. The ram's on some kind of table, with bindings around his neck, wrists, and fetlocks. <sniffs> Oh, Carl. The ram cranes his neck in what looks like a painful fashion to look at me. His eyes are puffy and bloodshot, far beyond his usual pink-hued, drug-induced haze. He's been crying. A lot. Carl! I exclaim, my voice half whisper, half shout. What's going on? Are you really Chase? His voice is weak, cracking with each enunciation. I can see the veins in the ram's neck bulge through his thin, through his thin fur when he tries to speak. What? Of course it's really me. Did Brian nab you too? Shakily, the ram nods his head, his horns making clacking noises against the wood table. It's all a fucking nightmare, dude. I can't... I can't tell what's real anymore. Everything's fuzzy. He squeezes his fists and wrenches his wrists back, trying to warm... trying to warm his way out of the bindings. He keeps coming by and tightening the wrap around my neck. Until I, I can only get a tiny bit of air. After a few minutes, I start seeing lights popping and ev everything goes all dark and grainy. Over and over again. It's at that point I notice there's something hanging above him on the ceiling. A mirror. Ornately framed with gold-colored trim and pinned up with rusty metal stakes. It's so starkly fancy and out of place, considering the rest of the trashy interior. Jesus. I strain against the collar around my neck, trying to get a better look at my own bindings. It's hard to see, but this collar looks like it's bolted to the wood-paneled walls on both sides of my neck. Haphazardly, too, as it jiggles whenever I shift too hard. At the same time, the edges of the collar are not exactly smooth. I feel like if I yank too quickly, the metal would cut into my own neck. Are, are the cops coming? I just want to go home, man. I share the sentiment, though right now I'm just trying to get my bearings. The edge of my forehead where Brian hit me throbs with pain every couple seconds. There's no air conditioning in here either, and I can't help but feel like I'm sitting in a hot car that smells like a dumpster. There's a pungent aroma of body odor, odor mixed with some kind of, like, rotting fruit. Every breath I take just brings more of that scent into me, until I can practically taste it on my tongue. I don't know. I finally respond. Carl's heart visibly sinks. His eyes darting around the room before finally settling, settling on something to my right. L Leo? I blink and delicately try to turn my head to peer beside me. Crumpled on the floor and bound in a similar type of bondage to my own is Leo. Still unconscious. His lip is split and a little bit of blood is pulled onto the gray carpet. Fortunately, he's still breathing, the big chest of his rising and falling in a slow rhythm. It looks like he took that strike earlier, mainly on his muzzle. Hopefully that means his head itself didn't take too much of the brunt, which undoubtedly would have worsened the hell out of his concussion. Leo, wake up! I hear him grunt softly, like I just disturbed him from a pleasant nap. His eyes already seem like they're half open, so whether he's truly been sleeping so whether he's truly sleeping right now isn't clear. Stretching out, I can just barely manage to nudge him with the tip of my tail. Leo, come on! Another soft groan. He looks beat up. Carl rasps. Yeah, Brian beat him pretty bad. Twice. Oh. Orange-scented sunlight seeps in from between the slats of the closed blinds across the room. It must still be daytime out, but just barely. I wonder why Jenna isn't here. Maybe she got away. Outside, there's a pronounced puttering noise drawing closer. It vibrates the room we're in slightly, and there's the faint noise of oldies music that carries on along with it. A car, maybe an old pickup truck. Carl goes quiet, listening as well. Next, voices. They sound terse, argumentative. Going after your fucking sister? One says, higher pitched and pained. Well, it's Clint, okay. They brought it on themselves. Clint. Leo was right. He was involved. Fucker. 
Oh, Jeremy. What do you think he's gonna do to him? Jeremy's voice comes through comes through less annoyed than the other two. He sounds almost afraid. Ugh. The same thing he did to Keith, you mangy fuck. That high pitched voice. It's Misha. Well fuck, at least he's alive. You don't know that. Yeah, shut the fuck up, Misha. Don't disrespect him with this sort of conspiracy shit now. You done screwed several pooches, and I ain't covering for you. You don't know shit. I can hear another car pull up. This one with a much quieter engine. Car visibly tense as seemingly recognizing the sound. It's him, dude. A car door slams and the voice is silence. <laughs> Hello there. Bit of a day, huh? The silence continues for a while until Brian speaks again. After you. Clint makes a little irk and the door to the room we're in opens. The ringtail enters, his composure far more timid than I'm used to. He blinks when he sees Leo and I bound to the wall, staring at the two of us wordlessly. Go on, what was it that you were going to tell me? Brian enters in after him, the hulking bearer having ducked to fit through the doorway. Carl quickly closes his eyes, trying to pretend he's asleep. The bear's focus remains entirely upon Clint, with Clint looking like he's practically withering under his gaze. Hey, I think Duke said he was going to be here in a couple minutes. Apparently folk are gathering at Town Hall wondering what's going on. The bear glances back over his shoulder and extends then extends in an arm out through the doorway, grabbing something. I struggle to turn my head enough to see what. Oh, Jenna. Let go! Jenna's tone is cold, completely curt despite the circumstances. Fortunately, she doesn't look too beaten up beyond her fur being a little tussled. Brian's holding her by her arm, and tightly, due to judging by the wince on her face. Her stony demeanor visibly fades as she sees the three of us bound up. This is barbaric! Brian ignores her comments, dragging her across the stained carpet to an old radiator in the corner. With some errant chain, he gets to work tying her to it. She seems to be getting spa spared the neck choker treatment. You mentioned there were others with him. The cat boy and the mayor's cocksucking nephew, right? TJ, uh... TJ, um, <clears throat> sorry, mm. TJ, Flynn, TJ and Flynn, yeah. <laughs> Flynn, right, I know him. He's the one with the big bottom. I, Clint rubs his scabbed arms, looking anywhere but Brian. I, I don't know. He quickly tries to shift the direction of the conversation. D Duke was talking about them. Do you want us to bring them in too, in case they got some incriminating stuff on their phones? That works for me. Hey, little Jerry, what you doing out there? Bring in the last one. Sure enough, Jeremy sheepishly enters the room with his paw on Misha's shoulder. The bat is trembling, walking with a limp and a swollen nose. Jeremy looks directly at Jenna for a moment, a flicker of shock on his face at seeing her and the rest of us in such a sorry state. You guys are such shit. It's finally happening. You all are going to turn on me just like that? Succumb to it? Hey man, you're the one to start. You're the one who started trying to kill our boss with a wrench. That sounds an awful lot like succumbing to it to me. He killed Keith, dude. No, he didn't. You're just hallucinating. Brian lets out an indiscernible noise from the other side of the room, finishing up some bindings around Jenna's ankles. Brian seems like he's in his element, as if this whole kidnapping business is about as strenuous as a trip for groceries. However, the mission of Keith does elicit a visible tensing of the bear. Don't appreciate that kind of disingenuous assertion. Look, you just need to chill out here. Smoke some weed or something. That's the trick to make it go away, right? Oh, yeah. We're all gonna get real high and ride it out, little fellas. Brian smiles, showcasing his broken teeth. You ain't got nothing to fret over. The rotund Fennec pulls out a phone from his pocket, one that looks like a burner that Misha showed me earlier. Oof. Still can't get a hold of Heather. We gotta look for her too, man. Clint, who had been unusually quiet, snaps to attention as he realizes Jeremy is talking to him. Huh? Oh, well, check your pa's place then. Oh, you're going there? Take Carl with you. I might need the rack. Only been a few days and I've almost got him trained already. T trained? Shouldn't be too much of a flight risk. I look at Carl, who's still trying to pretend he's asleep. He's not doing a very good job, as I can still see his leg shaking. Not that I'd be able to do any better in his position. Clint, without a word, moves the tape to the table and fastens each trap, and buckles as if he were personally familiar with each. He pulls at the ram's soiled and slightly bloody tank top. Come on. 
he mutters. Call complies, his fetlocks nearly buckling beneath him as his hooves touch the ground for the first time in a long while. He doesn't dare look at the rest of us, keeping his gaze down. Good boy! Brian mumbles, rumbles, grinning to himself. Carl flinches. Clint, pull, Clint pulls something that shimmers in the faint light out of the back of his pants, and it takes me a minute to realize it's a gun. He presses the middle of the barrel against the ram's spine, his lanky finger hovering over the trigger. As I see the ringtail step around and push open the door, I notice that Carl is not the only one shaking now. Clint's own hand shivers fiercely. Like any second, like any second, he might accidentally squeeze his finger back. Jesus, man, this is getting fucking dark. Oof. This situation is definitely different than it was before. Hmm. God, man. Oof. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. This has been another episode of Echo Genesis Path. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that notification bell for the next video. I love you all. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye!